Hello, my name is Dr. R. Sanchez, and I'm a research fellow in the study of race and anti-racism in Gamblin Keys College, and I'm an affiliate lecturer in sociology at Cambridge. Today, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Marie, Elena Maria Murillo. She is an assistant professor in gender, women, and sexuality studies at the University of Iowa, and she will be speaking with us about La Margaret Sanger of the Borderlands, Guadalupe Arispe de la Vega, contraception, and Mexico's Maquiladora system. And before we start, um, please make sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Reproductive Justice Cam. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Um, studies at the History Department at the University of Iowa. Murillo received her doctorate in Borderlands History at the University of Texas at El Paso in 2016. And her work focuses on the intersections of reproductive freedom, race, gender, um, class, and sexuality, as well as immigration and Latinx subjectivities. Uh, for instance, she's currently completing her manuscript titled Fighting for Control, Reproductive Care, Race, and Power in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. And this specific talk is uh, titled La Margaret Sanger of the Borderlands, Guadalupe Arice de la Vega, uh, Contraceptions, and Mexico's Maquiladora uh, System. So thank you very much for being with us today, Lina. Thank you so much, Rachel, for inviting me, and um, I look forward to this talk. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen, and we'll get started. Can everyone see? Yes, perfect. Um, <clears throat> so this talk <clears throat> is actually um, part of uh, a chapter in my book, and so I just want to kind of quickly go over um, what my book is about and sort of situate my my talk today um, within that that larger project that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, and so so the brief overview is this what I'm attempting to do in my book is to displace um, white women reproductive rights centered histories and recover the stories of Chicanas, Mexicanas and Mexican origin women's struggle for reproductive care. Um, in the 20th century borderlands. Um, and I essentially am attempting to disrupt narratives that have foregrounded for a very long time civil rights as the main driver for social um, activism in the movement for reproductive re freedom by arguing that um, what Mexican origin women were doing um, was seeking a holistic kind of reproductive care based on notions of human dignity and mutual responsibility. And, and I'm calling that reproductive care. Um, but while Chicanas and Mexicanas fought for access to healthcare in a region that was awash um, in racialist immigration regimes, exploitative labor conditions, and um, de facto segregation, effectively racializing them out of claims to American citizenship, um, they also worked inside and out of population control and family planning um, regimes. Um, that also, you know, that further racialized uh, Mexican origin women's reproduction as inherently excessive and hostile to a presumed white body politic in the U.S. and later on in Mexico also became an economic threat. And so um, my talk is, is based on that latter part, right? So what is going on um, in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, but really in the Mexico-U.S. borderlands in the 1970s and 1980s, and how does the movement for family planning and population control that had grown fairly powerful um, along the U.S.-Mexico border in the United States and Texas, how does it begin to move across the border? And so I situate it within um, sort of local politics and local organizing. So early transnationalists like Betty Mary Getting, who was the president of El Paso's first birth control uh, clinic in the borderlands um, and who later on uh, merged with Planned Parenthood Federation of America and her supporters, people like Margaret Singer. So Margaret Singer did lots of work in El Paso, Texas and really in the Southwest um, in the early 1930s and 1940s. In fact, Margaret Singer goes on to move to Tucson, Arizona, and that's where she that's where she ends up um, passing away in the 1960s. Um, and they believed that their missionary style campaigns for contraception should flow across the border, producing um, properly planned families um, in the U.S. and in Mexico. 
But it's not until the 1970s that Planned Parenthood of El Paso um, helps establish uh, a clinic, a birth control clinic in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, which is El Paso's sister city. Um, and and it's Guadalupe Arispe de la Vega who is the sort of you know support for this, um, and she's a wealthy Mexican philanthropist who provides money and social standing and connections for this clinic. Now, De La Vega's maquiladora business in Ciudad Juarez sustained her activism, indicating deep ties between fam wealthy families on both sides of the border and their concerns for overpopulation, women's reproduction, and labor. Um, and so this is this was not originally supposed to be part of the book, but um, I did a lot of research and I could not um, I could not deny right the importance and significance of, of the work of Guadalupe Arispe de La Vega. So here's where the story starts. One cool Los Angeles evening in May 1987, Guadalupe Arispe de La Vega was the main draw at an event in Beverly Hills, California. The Southern California Population Crisis Committee eagerly awaited her presentation about her borderlands philanthropy and public service. De La Vega held the audience of three dozen attendees captive as she spoke about her organization's family planning mission in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. De La Vega, the founder of FEMAP, and that's Federación Mexicana de Asociaciones y Empresas Privadas, represented a, quote, light in the darkness for the members of the Southern California Population Crisis Committee. They responded positively to her groundbreaking work, the dissemination of contraception fundamental to battling um, Mexico's population growth. In her talk, De La Vega noted how, quote, demographic and environmental tensions increase each day and have a strong impact on natural resources, she said. Increasingly, she continued, they determine the quality of life on our planet. The Southern California Population Crisis Committee was um, primed for De La Vega's neo-Malthusian talking points. This organization was an offshoot of the Washington, D.C.-based Population Crisis Committee, founded in 1965 by William Draper, a wealthy financier consumed with fears of overpopulation, who had dedicated much of his time, financial resources, and cultural capital to ending overpopulation in the global south. Echoing rhetoric that connected environmental devastation to overpopulation, De La Vega enthusiastically placed Mexico at the forefront of global family planning efforts. Many international organizations recognized her work via Mexico's national um, population program. She garnered a United Nations Population Control Award as well as the Margaret Singer Award for, from Planned Parenthood in 1985. And here she is receiving that award on, on this slide. Um, and she's next to um, Dr. Alan Rosenfeld, who dedicated much of his career um, to supporting women's health. <clears throat> And he was actually a main um, driver in the HIV AIDS pandemic as Dean, or like in sort of supporting research for the um, HIV AIDS pandemic as Dean of the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. And he was also director of Planned Parenthood Federation of America from 1986 to 1987. So <clears throat> De La Vega's you know, De La Vega was able to sort of ply the audience with sobering statistics describing how Mexico's population um, had grown from 20 million in 1940 to nearly 18 million by 1986. Demographic projections foresaw an increase of over 23 million people by the year 2000. Mexico's supposed rapid expansion kept many of Southern California Population Crisis Committee members, such as their director, Ben Lowry, up at night. Lowry, who expressed some doubt that De La Vega's contraceptive campaigns could alter these figures, determined that overpopulation would be a disaster for those living on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. Quote, up until now, they, illegal Mexicans, have had the safety net of El Norte, that's closed down now. You can't hire illegal aliens anymore, he lamented. Others in the audience openly wondered how De La Vega, a practicing Catholic, was received by the Catholic Church in Mexico. Her clinics, she explained, were less like Planned Parenthood in the United States because they offered pre- and postnatal care. Otherwise, she reasoned, quote, no one in Mexico would go 
in addition to assisting Mexican women with access to better health care, um, helping them have healthier pregnancies and babies, FEMAP offered women information about birth control and access to contraceptives. These charitable efforts and De La Vega's high social standing ingratiated her with the Catholic Church. Quote, I don't have any problems with the bishop. He's a very good friend of mine. Our bishop has never opposed our family planning cause, De La Vega reassured her audience. She lauded Juarez church officials stating, quote, even priests send people to the clinic to have tubal ligations. And she remarked how nuns perform charitable acts as volunteers for FEMAP delivering babies. Quote, bishops and priests understand the tremendous need for family planning, De La Vega declared. Operating in a Catholic country where abortion was, uh, was still illegal, De La Vega expressed the church's support for family planning agenda as a critical way to, quote, prevent abortions. Guadalupe Arispe De La Vega, her very persona, assuaged the crowd's skepticism. The media, the media had often likened her to Grace Kelly. She dressed stylishly, wearing her platinum blonde tresses, gently framing her face, Plus, and more importantly, she was incredibly, incredibly rich. Guadalupe de la Vega had unequivocally committed her life to the family planning movement in Mexico. In the 1970s, this meant a profound fixation with overpopulation as the family planning movement's global mission was nearly indistinguishable from population control advocacy in the latter part of the 20th century. And here I'm using um, uh, the sort of um, definition of population control expressed um, by the collective uh, in the, the um, edited volume, Undivided Rights, um, where they say, quote, since the turn of the 20th century, population control efforts have been intended to prevent women of color from having children. And I would add women, um, obviously, in the global south as well. Thus, they state, eugenic laws, immigration restrictions, sterilization abuses, targeting family planning and welfare reform have all been vehicles for um, population control. And, in, and this is what I'm sort of arguing, De La Vega is part of, part of the story um, in the, the Mexico borderlands. So her charm and her movie star air, along with her family's reputation in the borderlands, persuaded important community leaders and international donors to invest in population control and family uh, planning campaigns along Mexico's northern border. And as the epitaph on this slide contends, overpopulation became a major economic and social concern for Mexican officials and global policymakers by the mid 1970s and into the 1980s. The year before De La Vega's visit to Beverly Hills, Mexico's incoming and outgoing presidents both agreed that, quote, Mexico's overpopulation was a backdrop to all of Mexico's problems, close quote. The focus on overpopulation was a relatively recent concern since the government, although never coming out to overwhelmingly to an overwhelming consensus, had maintained a mostly pro-natalist stance for much of the 20th century. Historian Ana Raquel Minian explains that from 1821 to the early 1970s, quote, the country's policymakers tended to cast population growth as essential for economic growth and nation building. These issues included not only questions of reproduction, but also overlap with concerns for immigration to and emigration from Mexico. While some Mexican officials had cast immigration, so leaving Mexico, as a potential danger to Mexico's national goals of modernity, order, and progress after the 1910 revolution, other Mexican policymakers and social scientists promoted circular migration, whereby Mexican workers would go to the United States to learn new techniques and technologies, bring them back, um, and then bringing them back these newly acquired knowledges to support the modernization of their home country. This latter group supported institutionalization of circular migration through what many of us know as the Bracero program, which was from 1942 to 1964. Right, the sort of binational treaty um, for guest workers between the U.S. and Mexico, where over four million Mexican men um, migrated uh, to the United States um, after World War II. So over a decade um, after the Bracero program ended, Mexican and U.S. officials met privately to discuss ways Mexico might offset its, quote, now chronic overpopulation pro uh, problem. 
The Mexican government suggested the U.S. government turn a blind eye to undocumented migration as it was vital to mitigating Mexico's unemployment issues. Yet other stakeholders in Mexico and abroad believed a robust birth control campaign could do the work undocumented immigration to the U.S. could not stem the birth rate among poor Mexican origin women. And so Guadalupe de la Vega takes up this population control mantle in the early 1970s with support from Planned Parenthood of El Paso. De la Vega's spirited concern for Mexico's population issues resembled the activism of women like Betty Mary Getting, who was, um, as I stated earlier, right, the president, the first president of the birth control movement uh, and the birth control clinic in El Paso, Texas um, in the 1930s. Now, there were deep connections between the two activists and their organizations. FAMAP represented the culmination of activism and advocacy on the part of the international family planning movement with ties to Planned Parenthood Federation of America, the International Planned Parenthood Federation, and Planned Parenthood of El Paso. A deeper exploration of these connections provides a broader history of one of the borderlands most powerful families. Um, excuse me, family planning institution showing how over time FEMAP, and here's a picture of their um, hospital in Juarez today, um, became central to health and reproductive control in Mexico's northern border. So along with Centro de Salud Familia La Fe, which, in, which is another clinic that I look at in another chapter in my book, that was a Chicano, Chicana run um, institution that was um, established in the 19, uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, FEMAP, on the other hand, and it was like this like pluralistic space that was created for the community, FEMAP was really exclusively run by, by Guadalupe Arispe de la Vega um, and did not have like a robust sort of community engaged support initially. Um, and so it's, and she was really, um, you know, it, it was her wealth that helped create um, this institution. And FEMAP and de la Vega story is critical turning point in the transnational movement of ideas about family planning and population control in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, a region that for decades had experienced a ramping up of immigration controls. Despite the end of the formalized binational Bracero program in 1964, the need for Mexican labor did not recede and immigration continued. Border patrol and immigration controls became more coercive and brutal, particularly as multinational corporations known as maquiladoras began to appear in border communities along Mexico's north. The proliferation of these maquiladoras in places like Ciudad Juarez and other border cities like Tijuana um, is critical to the story of populate population control and the dissemination of contraceptives in Mexico's northern borderlands. While Guadalupe Arispe de la Vega worked to bring greater awareness of contraception to Mexico, her husband, Federico de la Vega Matthews, was a key figure in establishing the exploitative maquiladora system in Juarez, one that relied almost exclusively on the labor of impoverished Mexican women. As the El Paso Times editorial board put it, after um, Federico de la Vega Matthews' death in 2015, his name was nearly synonymous um, for the de quote development in Juarez and its support of education, the maquiladora industry, health and sports, which now transcend generations. The newspaper noted that the family's most important legacy was the establishment of FEMAP. Uh, to address, quote, health and human development concerns in Juarez. And it was, quote, a model widely duplicated across Mexico and the U.S. border areas. So rather than view FEMAP as a simple charity created to address the dearth of health care services um, for reproductive age women in the region, I'm arguing um, that the work of De La Vega needs to be connected to the lineage of neo Malthusian activists, uh, including Betty Mary Getting and Margaret Singer, who sought to oppose overpopulation by addressing Mexican origin women's supposed hyperfertility in the borderlands. Not only did De La Vega receive support from Planned Parenthood of El Paso in her early quest to open a birth control clinic in Juarez, but she framed her crusade as one that would impact industrialization and modernization along Mexico's border by clamping down on Mexico's excessive population growth. De La Vega, like getting um, decades before, attacked the problem at the root, and that was Mexican origin women's reproduction. And 
quickly, I just want to say that this is part of a larger like history in, in Mexico, right? Um, Guadalupe Arispe de la Vega's work and FEMA's existence relied on a longer history of eugenicists, uh, demographers, scientists, doctors, philanthropists, political scientists, and activists who sought to revive Thomas Malthus's 18th century theory of population growth and resource depletion. And though many lauded Malthus's ideas in his day, he inspired men like Charles Darwin and later Sir Francis Galton to produce theories on evolution and perfecting the human species. Uh, Malthus's true legacy, however, resides in the 20th century's population control movement. His treatise on population growth and the subsequent resource collapse that was sure to ensue um, became a canonical text for those interested in controlling and disciplining populations for different ends. Um, since the turn of the 20th century, scientists, wealthy financiers, and activists in the U.S. and Europe were consumed by what they believed to be rampant population control, excuse me, rampant population growth among the so-called unfit, uh, mostly who were mostly marginalized, poor communities the world over. But it's not until the 1950s and 1960s that we see nation states taking up the mantle of population control, supporting endeavors of international advocates and financiers, as well as enacting their own um, population control programs. And Mexico is no different. Historians have shown how Mexican scientists and population, excuse me, and politicians' interest in population quality and quantity stretched far back before the revolutionary period and strengthened as concerns grew for the nation's ability to modernize properly and quickly after 1910. Um, historian Alexandra Mina Stern explains that eugenics became the quote, handmaiden that bound ideologies uh, of heredity such as mesisophilia and biotypology together as science and policy changed and adapted over time. After the 1910 revolution, policymakers and politicians attempted to socially engineer a population based on what they believed was um, you know, the best sort of nationalist vision, uh, this idea of mestizaje, the racial mixing of European, indigenous, and African um, communities, although as many of us know, who city Mexico, um, Afro-Mexicanos, you know, there was a massive delay in even recognizing them as a population, as a community. Um, and then later on, we have uh, Mexican philosopher Jose Vasconcelos calling this La Raza Cosmica, right? And Mexican eugenicists sought ways to address Mexico's, quote, social problems through a mishmash of sources. Um, and in the early, uh, 20th century, um, especially during the revolution, you had some feminists attempting to sort of, feminists in Mexico, um, to talk about the quote unquote hygiene of the species. And part of that was to talk about birth control. So they did sort of pass around uh, leaflets and were concerned with, um, with access to contraception. Um, one such leaflet that they passed around was La Brújula del Hogar, and I'm like searching for it. If anybody knows about it, I'm, I want to see it. Um, in English, uh, it was called the Home Compass, um, right? But talking about family planning, and this is something that I'm arg not arguing against, but, um, but really kind of trying to think through, even though feminists in Mexico were talking about planificación natal in the early 20th century, it does not really transform into actual like massive changes um, and access to, to contraception in Mexico. That comes on a little later. Um, and some scholars have wrongly attributed failing, uh, excuse me, falling fertility rates in Mexico um, at the, uh, you know, during the revolution and in the years you know, from about 1910 to around 1930. Um, some scholars have wrongly attributed this to, you know, um, the revolutionary fervor of Mexico. Um, but actually, uh, some demographers suggest that, the, that these population declines um, really are due to the calamities at the end of the Porfiriato and through the revolution, including war, famine, the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic, emigration, and a prolonged separation of color, uh, uh, couples, excuse me, because of armed conflict. Um, now, there were attempts to revive interest in family planning throughout, you know, much of the 20th century in Mexico. But as some demographers maintain, in the aftermath of these various periods of national violence and war and declining fertility rates, the Mexican state's focus was on increasing its population. The Mexican state, led for decades by the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, or the PRI, 
viewed the expansion of its population as inextricably linked to economic development and strengthening of its nationalist aims. The government's pronatalist stance based on wonky connections of unending modernization and development via population growth provided the ideology that led to Mexico's high fertility rates as compared to other Latin American countries and the United States. A Spanish demographer, um, Amado de Miguel argues, this belief supported the political aims of PRI, uh, the religious conservatives, and demographers in, the, in Mexico for nearly 60 years. Another Mexican scholar stated it this way, the Mexican state's philosophy during this period boiled down to quote, gobernar es poblar, or to govern is to populate. The Mexican state concentrated its efforts on improving health programs and reducing high mortality rates among its citizens, as well as strengthening social welfare efforts to ensure population growth. The quote, notion of Mexico's greatness and its relation to a large population were incorporated into school textbooks and large families were officially encouraged by social recognition and monetary awards. These elements uh, accorded with population, with, excuse me, with popular religious sentiment and national pride. Thus, Mexico's population boom did coincide with an economic one, producing what scholars have called the Mexican miracle in the years after World War II. What Mexico saw as a model of third world development driven by state-led capitalist efforts, others saw as a population out of control. As economist Zadia Feliciano states, quote, Mexico had one of the fastest growing populations in the world during the 1960s. From 1940 to 1970, Mexico's population expanded exponentially. And by 1970, it boasted nearly 50 million inhabitants. As late as 1971, after international efforts were beginning to help provide Mexico with substantial family planning, and different types of family planning infrastructure and population control advocates had marked Mexico specifically as too densely populated to progress in a modernizing world, then President Luis Echeverria continued to exalt Mexico's rising fertility and its connections to unending economic development. For me, this demographic history suggests that biological theories about Mexican origin women's inherent hyperfertility were based on erroneous and racialist machinations. US, excuse me, US birth control activists, anti-abortion, anti-immigrant eugenicists, and later um, population control advocates and demographers charged Mexican origin women with unhinged procreation. They reasoned that a combination of Catholic devotion, superstition, lasciviousness, ignorance, chronic poverty, and a deep love of family made Mexican origin women naturally excessive procreators. These bigoted conclusions manifested themselves through the 20th century in US population control schemes, immigration restrictions, and welfare debates, and in racializing projects that from their inception determined Mexican origin women, and later all Latinas from the hemisphere, as suffering from extreme fertility. In other words, it is a fallacy to suggest that large families were a timeless aspect of the Mexican origin community. Rather, higher fertility rates were in some cases produced and supported by state efforts seeking economic and social development in 20th century Mexico. International population control theories place Mexico's burgeoning populace at the center of Planned Parenthood of El Paso's mission to clamp down on the potential for Mexico's population spilling over the border. In 1963, regional director and the former president of Planned Parenthood of El Paso, Cornelia Love Owen, faced a crowded El Paso Kiwanis Club meeting to engage in what newspapers called, quote, a frank and open discussion of a controversial subject. Cornelia Love Owen declared a population emergency in Ciudad Juarez, stating that its birth rates were the highest in the world, placing, quote, a problem of international scope at El Paso's doorstep. Love Owen went on to remind her audience that higher fertility rates raised the, quote, cost of welfare, the aid to dependent children programs, and operation of health and hospital services, and potentially cost the city of El Paso thousands of dollars as many women sought underground abortions in Juarez and then crossed back to El Paso hospitals for extended care. She stated unequivocally that Planned Parenthood of El Paso was quote, concerned with the quality rather than quantity of children. Her statement is telling. 
in that by the 1960s, uh, eugenics and its focus on better breeding had been subsumed by neo-Malthusian concerns for population quantity in relation to natural resources. Yet championing child spacing for the pro protection of mother and child, as Planned Parenthood called it, was intimately tied to no notions of eugenically fit families. Her comments were also a not so subtle jab against the Mexican state's pronatalist ideologies. To Owen and likely much of her audience in El Paso, Mexico cared more about quantity than quality of its citizens. Now, during these same years, we have Guadalupe Arisbela Vega, and here she is looking beautiful. This is um, in celebration of her wedding with her husband, um, Federico, Arispe, uh, Federico de la Vega Matthews, excuse me. Now, during that same time, Guadalupe de la Vega became an active member of the population control movement in Mexico. Her entrance into the birth control universe was akin to the story of Margaret Singer. In 1912, Singer, a nurse working in the immigrant enclaves of Brooklyn, New York, witnessed a young mother of three's death from a botched self-induced abortion after begging Singer for birth control information weeks before. De La Vega, like Singer, also claimed a woman's traumatic abortion story as the impetus for her activism. In the late 1960s, De La Vega read a newspaper account about a young mother of nine children who had attempted to stab herself in the abdomen in order to abort her 10th pregnancy. De La Vega later visited the mother in jail, and this is all occurring in Juarez, um, and inquired as to why the mother did not practice family planning. To De La Vega's surprise, Quote, the woman lacked the most basic knowledge about preventing pregnancy. De La Vega obtained legal counsel for this uh, young mother and determined to never let this happen again to another woman. This moment transformed De La Vega's life. Um, for the next 50 years, she dedicated herself to educating poor women about the importance of family planning. Now, in the early days of her career as an advocate for contraception, De La Vega combined a charitable spirit with a deep desire for economic development and population control in Ciudad Juarez and Greater Mexico. Her philosophy was in line with the work of her husband, Federico De La Vega Matthews, one of the most important financiers in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands and founder of the maquiladora industry in Juarez. Their public story in the early days is hazy. It's really difficult to find information about them. I, I think that they've likely scrubbed um, a lot of the internet and it's really also hard to find um, things in the archive about them. Um, but they were fronterizos by birth. Guadalupe de la Vega was born Ma Maria Guadalupe Arispe de la Maza to her parents, Emilio Arispe and Elena de la Maza in Monterrey, Nuevo León in 1936. Um, and now her husband, <clears throat> excuse me, although she did, you know, seek to align herself with the relief efforts and welfare um, reform in Mexico, specifically lifting, quote unquote, poor Mexican women out of poverty, her concerns for overpopulation and her husband's business um, severely complicated her altruistic mission in the borderlands. While Guadalupe de la Vega's family connected their lineage directly to Mexico's northern border, Federico um, de la Vega Matthews was born actually in El Paso, Texas in 1931 to Artemio de la Vega and Catherine Matthews. His mother was born at the turn of the century in Midland, Texas, so she was an Anglo woman, and his father was actually from Spain, from Asturias, Spain. De La Vega Sr. had immigrated to Mexico at the age of 14 and had arrived in Ciudad Juarez in 1928. The Asturian arose to prominence over the years, becoming a central figure in industry and commercial enterprises, as well as land development in um, Mexico's northern border. Federico, his son, right, continued his father's business in collaboration with various Mexican industrialists of the region, including Antonio J. Bermudez, Fernando Borreguero and Alfonso Murgia. And these are like some of the like metal metals, like these are the heavy hitter industrialists in Mexico, um, especially in, in Ciudad Juarez. And he expanded, um, De La Vega expanded his family's reign in the region in education development and as one of the masterminds behind the maquiladora system across Mexico's northern border. So linkages between Guadalupe Arispe de la Vega's population control advocacy and her husband's business deserve further scrutiny as scholars have rightly argued how maquiladora work became, quote, women's work toward the end of the 20th century. Historians like Vicky Ruiz um, have stated, quote, maquiladoras preferred young women on the assembly line. They did indeed. 
One uh, El Paso Herald Post journalist confirmed, quote, a Juarez labor force comprised of some 70% women workers account for over 4,000 jobs created by twin plants in Juarez in 1966. Accompanying this reporter's story were various pictures, including one of hundreds of women waiting in a line outside of the Antonio J. Bermudez, Bermudez Industrial Park and RCA plant in 1972. Bermudez, along with Federico La Vega and others, eagerly supported the proliferation of maquiladores that placed women workers at the center of this exploitative business model. By the 1980s, several important data points were established for women working at various hierarchies of the maquiladora system. For instance, electronic working, excuse me, for instance, electronic industries preferred younger women than those in garment shops, an average age of 21 to 27, respectively. Those assembling electronics were also better educated, averaging a total of eight years of schooling than women working as seamstresses was with only six years. Most importantly, electronic assembly plants preferred non-married women, often requiring them to show medical examinations that were, quote, nothing more than a simple pregnancy test, likely confirming a negative result. This kind of reproductive control, one that was integral to Mexico's rising maquiladora system, needed guidance from someone who understood what was at stake if women workers did not get adequate access to family planning. With very little exceptions, birth control and concerns for overpopulation um, had an overwhelming focus on economically poor women in the global south for most of the 20th century. And Ciudad Juarez would become a perfect test case for testing the limits and borders of population control at the intersections of reproductive labor and biological reproduction among Mexican origin women workers. Guadalupe de la Vega would lead these efforts producing a model that was replicated across Mexico toward the end of the 20th century. And I'm almost finished here. De la Vega's first clinic was built in 1973, where the Hospital de la Familia sits today. It was just a few rooms dedicated to providing um, family planning information to Mexican women in Juarez. At that time, it was not equipped for delivering um, babies. But the story goes that when De la Vega opened the doors to a desperate woman in labor, the singular act um, started a decades long expansion process that resulted in providing maternity care. FEMA boasted delivering over 100,000 babies by 2010. Uh, by 1980, however, Mexican officials and population control advocates were holding up FEMAP and Mexico as an example of what a dedicated family planning and contraceptive campaign could do to bring population numbers down. By 1973, President Echeverria uh, capitulated to population control rhetoric and changed course on Mexico's pronatalist stance. Uh, estimates from 1982 show the birth rate had fallen 2.3%. International organizations took notice. William McCreevy of the World Bank said, quote, if you compare where Mexico was in the early 1970s with where it is now, you could not count on the fingers of one hand the number of countries that have been able to match its success. Dr. Joseph Speedle of the Washington Post Population Crisis Committee um, agreed, stating that, quote, Mexico was one of the greatest success stories of family planning in the world. Today, FEMAP does more than provide birth control. It's a massive health care uh, provider in the region. In fact, many people from uh, El Paso go to Juarez to obtain care at FEMAP. It's, it's much less expensive than health care in the U.S. is. Um, in 2010, it had a staff of over 144 doctors and 192 nurses. Hospital de la Familia now performs emergency care as well as routine and specialized surgeries for adults and children. Special, specialists were brought in to perform the hospital's first successful heart surgery in the early parts of the 20th century. And so I end with this. While many of us continue supporting organizations such as Planned Parenthood for their efforts in providing reproductive health care for the most marginalized and low income members of our communities, activists and scholars have rightly demanded that Planned Parenthood come clean about its deep connections to eugenics and population control schemes throughout the 20th century. Similarly, I'm arguing that organizations such as FEMAP and the Movement for Population Control writ large 
which is still alive and well today, I might add, must reckon with its not too distant mission of reproductive coercion as a tool for confronting immigration issues, constraining labor woes, and dismantling the social safety net. In other words, the history of population control in the latter part of the 20th century reveals itself as a, quote, handmaiden to austerity and neoliberal reforms. In addition, I hope these new histories push against insular theories of racial formation, especially when thinking about the U.S., uh, thinking about the history of Mexican origin people and the Mexico-U.S. borderlands. As this history shows, ideas about Mexican origin women supposed hyperfertility were mutually constituted by eugenicists, birth and population control advocates in the U.S., as well as politicians, religious institutions, and nationalists in Mexico. In this way, the family planning and population control movements provide a critical reassessment of globalization, transnationalism at the intersections of labor, reproduction, gender, and race well into the 21st century. Thank you all for listening to me ramble on and I open it up to questions. Oh, and this, I'll just say briefly, this is, um, so Guadalupe de la Vega won the CNN Heroes Award in 2010. And so here she is with Jessica Alba looking all fierce in her, <laughs> in her, you know, blonde, you know, her blonde dresses. Um, and you know she's she is um much older now and ha actually doesn't hasn't been seen in public for a very long time but as far as we know she is still um she's still at the head of a fem up in what is today so what was like the the price like was it like the heroes for family planning like how did they know like, it's just yeah. um CNN so for a while CNN had like it was called the CNN Heroes Award and so they would give it to people like all over the world who were doing heroic things so it didn't matter it was you could um you know you could apply or you could you know whatever for for it and so the people in in the border region and what I didn't talk about that much in my talk because it was already super long and I apologize for that. Um, Perfect. <laughs> um, uh, there were, by the 1990s, they create a um, nonprofit in El Paso, right? Because the majority of the funding that's coming, yes, it's coming from international organizations and and um, and from and from what is itself, but um, Texas and other local very wealthy people in El Paso want to support FEMAP, but they don't get tax write offs right if they donate to Mexican organizations, so they created a nonprofit in El Paso. Um, and it's this, it's run by this like super conservative like um, um, the wife of a very conservative El Paso politician. And so I think it was there, those people that nominated um, Guadalupe for the CNN Heroes Award. Oh, I see. But, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> sure. uh, I thought it was amazing. I see a lot of parallels with different things that I would love to talk to you about it. But I still like... I'm not going to use like my powers as chair just yet because I want to open up the floor for questions. But if there are no questions, like I'm, I'm going to ask mine. <laughs> I know I kept thinking of all of the work that you're doing in Mexico and I was like, I want to talk um, to you about this more. But yes, let's, you know, we can definitely geek out, geek out if people don't have questions. Yeah, that, I mean, I'm happy to geek out. Like mostly because like, you know, you started, um, like this conversation and you started this seminar with talking about environmental devastation and like the parallels between that and overpopulation and one of the first things that came to my mind was like Madison Grant like and how like Alexander people like Alexander Stern as well as like Jonathan Peter Spiro and all of this like have talked about like how Madison Grant like makes a lot of like eugenic concerns known through his work on like concert and like um conservation and like the environment and all of that stuff especially like in in California so it's very interesting how those parallels are there and like people need to like look at different like ways in which they can like fulfill that eugenic agenda or that like air of catastrophism right mm -hmm. which is very very interesting and I really love those parallels as well yeah I and I think 
you know, I think that Guadalupe de la Vega, and it's, it's wild. Um, there's just not much of her voice. Like it's really hard to find her speaking. So like the, um, uh, like the little quotes that I had of her at this um, at this meeting in Beverly Hills, and then she writes something for the when she receives the Margaret Singer Award. It's very rare, um, and even in you know videos and things that exist of her, um, it's you know it's always about her charity work at FEMOP, and there's very few like interviews of her, and I think it has to do with um, you know the ability of you know just how how wealthy they are I, and and like i said i didn't go into it in this talk but you know her family um her children have recently married into one of the you know billionaire family in el paso so it's like the de la vega foster family which is and they just own so much property and they own the they, they own a lot of the major sports teams in both cities they you know so like this this story has a lot to do in some ways with urban renewal which i'm not getting into in my book because i just don't have but it's she was using the you know the talking points of the time which is like the environment right while at the same time her family is instrumental in like producing like Offer awful environmental hazards, right? Like through the maquiladora system, through like urban renewal. So it's, you know, it's never the capitalist's fault for these things. It's always, the blame is always on like the poorest communities, the people at the, at the margins, right? And so it's, it's easier uh, in many ways to blame, um, obviously, you know, as we know, you know, the fertility, the unchecked fertility of Mexican origin women and Latinas in general um, than it is to to think about these things. But yeah, I, you know, it, it, oh, it never shocks me, <laughs> but it does, but it doesn't. The amount of pollution and, and environmental devastation that that those industries were doing. And then she's arguing that population control through contraception will actually solve the environmental issues. Definitely. And I think in the in the study of eugenics in general, like one of the things that Veronique Montier told me when I was starting my PhD and I was super lost about like which archives to look and where to start to look like one of the things that she said to me was like, follow the money. Right. Uh, because like part of like like eugenic concerns, like get like there to fill an agenda in like usually like economic concerns as well as racialization processes or like. I don't know, like racial capitalism and stuff like that are very much enmeshed into ideas around eugenics and neo-Malthusianism. Uh, so I was wondering, like, what, like, because you work borderlands, so that's a big, big word because you have to fly to many, many archives. So I was wondering, like, what, what were your archives or what, what were the main archives that you use for, for this massive, massive mammoth of a work? <laughs> Well, I'm glad you asked. So I wrote most of this chapter, as I said, I, I had written about um, Guadalupe de la Vega in my um, dissertation, just as an aside, like it was literally like two footnotes, and then I had moved on. And it was it, it, during the height of the pandemic, actually, um, that I, um, I was like, I, I want to look into this more. And it was actually after talking to Vicky Ruiz, who had written this like, you know, 30 page. She's a very well known, respected Chicana historian who looks at the history of Mexican origin women in the US. And she'd written in like the um, late 1980s, this like massive paper on, on the maquiladora system and women in the maquila system. And like, she'd never published it. It just had never gone anywhere. And so I met with her over the summer and she was, I, I mentioned, you know, my, this idea and she's like, oh, you should see like my, my archive of like maquiladora stuff that I have that I just never did anything with. No one ever wanted to like publish this paper. And so I dug in and I was like, oh my goodness. So it, it so it like happened kind of in this, like it is a very sort of borderlands way that I got to. So one was, thinking about the maquiladora system and, and you know what she's like, this is very much specifically women's work. And then and then looking at, you know, Guadalupe Arispe La Vega and her husband's literally like one of the founders of the maquiladora system. I was like, okay, here's a thing. 
Um, and then thinking about population, right? So I couldn't get down to the archives in Mexico because everything was closed and everything was shut down. So I was very fortunate to locate a research a researcher in in Mexico City who was like, <laughs> she's so funny. She works with other historians. She's a master's student at CIDE in in Mexico City, and she was just like, oh, I usually have to do like research that's really boring, but this stuff on contraception is like really excited, exciting. I will help you. And so she, one of the um, archives that we went to was the like the Ministro de, de Población or like the Ministerio de, de, of Population in Mexico, and it's this like tiny little archive that when she started to go, it, it was always closed, and she did a lot of work, kind of like. <laughs> you know, trying to get herself in there. And when she finally was able to get a meeting, they were shutting it down and they didn't know where those archives were gonna go. So they let her in there for like three days. And she just, and it was like a mess, like there were just boxes everywhere, nothing was in order. Um, but she was able to kind of locate some information on, on sort of the discourse of population control in the late 1970s and 1980s. Uh, in Mexico. And so I, you know, so it was like tracking that. And then, you know, thank God the internet, like the internet, <laughs> thank goodness, thank goodness for the internet. And just, you know, spending hours and hours and hours, you know, searching different databases and, and newspaper articles about, about FEMAP. So it's, it's a hodgepodge of, of sources really for this chapter. So at the end of the day, it's a very borderlands like methodology, which is fantastic, <laughs> isn't it? It's just like, <laughs> it's been uh, it it was so it's thrilling actually like this chapter i i love it because i think that it is this very it is such a border history yeah. um and about the way labor and and reproductive um you know freedom are so tied to issues of immigration of you know like all of these things are are tied together and i feel like um, you know, thinking about this one woman and the and the work that she did and the way that she was able to, you know, like include the Catholic Church and she's like, the bishops love me, you know, like all of this stuff that kind of flies in the face of um, the way that people, especially in the U.S., think about Mexico and, and the relationship to contraception and, and abortion um, really does kind of chip at those stereotypes. And another thing that I just like, well, I was like hearing you speak, like I know that there's a lot of like parallels between like, you know, my work in Mexico and your work in the borderlands, definitely. But one of the biggest, biggest like links that I see is how similar it is to the Puerto Rican context, uh, especially because like, even if the period or periodization is not the same, there's a lot of dynamics that repeat themselves, like especially in relation to like population control. I know that undivided rights, which you do like cite in your presentation, like talks a little bit about it. But this idea of like immigration and like how like people that go into the workforce, like they they prefer them to like have either a two ball ligation or be on uh, birth control pills or anything like that. Like all of those things like I see in the case of Puerto Rico as well. And like, I think it's something that is very, very interesting to trace those parallels, mostly because like the United States like was very much present in both of this context. So how does that work? Like, why is the periodization different? Like, does it work as a proto laboratory, like in this two different contexts to then like spread it to different parts of the world? It's, it's all very interesting, but I was wondering if you ever thought about those links between Puerto Rico's population control and then what happens in the borderlands with Ciudad Juarez. Um, absolutely. Uh, it's in another chapter. It's in the chapter, um, two chapters before this one, where, um, you know, that sort of looks up at, at um, contraceptive technologies. And so it's really like the late 1950s and into the 1960s. So when, you know, you know, Puerto Rico becomes the sort of, um, it, it becomes the epicenter of, of, you know, it becomes, as you said, the laboratory for testing out all of these new um, types of, of contraceptive technologies um, and some work and some don't that, you know, then you have people like Clarence Gamble, right? All, you know, these guys and they're like, where else can we ship this? Like what, what else, you know, where else could we see these wow. things working? And one of the places that they ship like Sana foam, the like spermicidal foam, 
that like doesn't really take off in Puerto Rico, like in El Paso, they loved it. Like they, the Planned Parenthood organization is like, oh, look at this company that's offering mm -hmm. us like two or three thousand dollars, which were, for them for their little clinic was like a lot of money to you know to try this on this community, right? And they're like, sure. Right. And and they write, you know, doctors and, and other public health people write papers, you know, in journals that, you know, get published. And they're like, these methods didn't work in Puerto. Right. Like in some way, they're they try they're trying to homogenize like Latinos, right, like Spanish speaking people. They're like, they like if they don't like it, well, but it, they're actually finding that like it depends. Right. Who, who's going to take these um, and use these these. Um, kinds of technologies. So I, yeah, Puerto Rico becomes like, you know, I, I sort of articulated as that, like, here's this other colonial space. So the borderlands is this other sort of like settler colonial space, right? Like Puerto Rico, and then we have the border region. Um, when things don't go the way that the population control advocates, you know, want in Puerto Rico, they're like, well, how about, <laughs> how about Mexicans, right? Um, and certainly, so it's, you know, for me, part of the work that I'm trying to do is to show that the birth control movement in many ways was always thinking about the global south, right, in in the, you know, in, in the Western hemisphere. Um, and that that's the history that needs to be kind of, you know, that's what we need to bring into the conversation and how um, how Latinas and how people in, in you know in the Caribbean and in Central and South America sort of understood these international movements for for population control and family planning, and you know that's you know the decentering of like the white women narrative. Um, I think is sort of you know what the work that you and I are trying to do um, is really about. Yeah, definitely. And I think before we wrap up, I have like one final final question. Uh, so, like, I was thinking, like, mostly because I just recently read it and it kind of blew my mind. Uh, there is this uh, book uh, by Maribel Moray. It's called Wise Philanthropy, an American Dilemma. And basically, like, what she's arguing in this book is that, like, a philanthropic organization, especially, like, in the Carnegie um, organization, um, like had like this like this very specific agenda to basically uh, assimilate certain people to like be complicit in this idea of white supremacy. And I think eugenics like was very much a part of that. So I was wondering, because you mentioned philanthropy, um, I was wondering if you saw that with the case of La Margaret Sanger uh, <laughs> de la Vega. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, I think it's, I mean, I think it's, you know, I, and I do mention philanthropy and I know the book that you're talking about and I'm glad it's out because I, I think I saw her on Twitter and I was like, oh, I need to get that book. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, and other people, other scholars have said this, right? It's a way to wash dirty money, right? Like it's a way to, and, and, and in some ways it's sort of fascinating that that's really part of like the Gilded Age and the, and the early part of the 20th century right, that you have like Ford and Carnegie Mellon and um, and the Rockefellers, right, like all of these people who like love to see museums named after themselves and like they were pumping in millions and millions of dollars um, in, essentially to like whitewash their image, right, and at the same time promote these very white supremacist ideas about society and culture. Right. Um, so this is like, and this is like very much what I think De La Vega is doing, um, right? Uh, because especially once the maquiladora system, uh, especially with the femicides in Juarez, right? I mean, we have to, you know, I, I end the chapter with that, right? Like when you have massive amounts of brutal violence against Mexican origin women and people are starting to blame it on, rightfully so, I think, right? The maquiladora system. And, and neoliberal policies, they're like, oh, well, we have FEMAP, right? And so they're always, right? Like, even when this guy dies, you know, there's no conversation around, um, you know, the the sort of destruction of Juarez um, through the maquiladora system, but it's like, wow, he created this healthcare center, 
that so many people use, right? So absolutely, you know, and thank you for reminding me that that book exists because I, I just cite that, you know, I'll cite her as a as a source, but definitely, right? Like this is this is what philanthropy is is a way to whitewash, yeah. um, you know, what these awful institutions do. Yeah. And I loved our show today. You and I did. <laughs> I know. It's like I, I need to open up the floor for questions. I've been very naughty on this. Uh, so does anybody like have a question or comments for Lena? Uh, so Phyllis Bergen says, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. I can't wait for your book. Uh, have you been able to talk to Guadalupe de la Vega or anyone in her, fan, in her family? I have not. And I've asked many times and they're like, absolutely not. Mm. They, uh, they have told me that she's not, this is what makes me, you know, I, I don't think that she's 100% doing well. I mean, she's, she's quite, you know, she's, 1936 right so she's in her 90s um she's uh, but she's still alive um but you know i asked almost i did try to reach out actually while i was right at the end of my finishing my dissertation just out of curiosity to see if she would talk to me and she said no and that they're that her people her publicist was like absolutely not funny that they still have a publicist and all of that stuff though oh yeah oh yeah and i think it you know i think things got you know i i don't know and I, i've talked to other people who've written so it's really interesting um geographers there's like really radical geographers that are that have been written writing about juarez for a very long time um and so i reached out to some of these geographers who you know talk about the de la vegas in in their work about like kind of ur urban renewal projects in Juarez. And so I reached out to some of them and they're like, Híjole, like, don't talk about them too much. Like, this is dangerous. And I was like, dangerous? <laughs> it's because they're such a powerful family and they have they pretty much have bought the sort of political um, system in Juarez. So it, it, it we'll see what happens when the book comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Aideen, you had a question. Hello, yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. That was incredibly interesting. Yeah, um, I am asking you a question from a perspective of general ignorance. I don't know an awful lot about um, this history that you're speaking to, but I was just curious because you compared or kind of made that connection mm -hmm. between um, De La Vega and Margaret Sanger in your title. I was curious to know kind of from the perspective, I suppose, um, of the reproductive rights movement or reproductive justice movement in Mexico right. not that that's a homogenous yeah. entity per se but like what position does De La Vega hold because if you take someone like Margaret Sanger for example I would wager that from a quite like white feminist liberal feminist standpoint she's still held up in some circles in in a quite uncritical kind of manner so I'm just mm -hmm. curious to know like does De La Vega hold a similar type of position within kind of reproductive rights activism in Me in the Mexican context, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And that's such a great question because I think she does in the border region, right? I think, um, I think that there are, I'll say this, the U.S.-Mexico border or the Mexico-U.S. border. So I'm really thinking about like the state of Chihuahua um, and Sonora and some of these other states. They're still fairly conservative states. Um, and so they like the idea of charity, right? They like the idea of wealthy people being in control of these sort of social issues. Um, and, uh, and so that like her image is like very much celebrated and appreciated. I think the problem is that, and this is was to um, the sort of off off camera comments that we had before um, the presentation began, that you know in places like Mexico City where people are talking about these things and scholars are talking about these things, like they don't often take the border into account. So even though at the time, right in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s you have the Mexican state and international organizations lauding the work that um, Guadalupe Arispe La Vega does. She's not seen as somebody important in the sort of grassroots movement. And I think rightly so, 
right? Like, I don't, you know, like, I don't think that, you know, the, um, the, the green wave, the marea verde is like, oh, we really should think about the work of this, you know, super wealthy philanthropist. I don't think that she's really on their radar because she was not like out advocating in the streets. That's not, you know, like in some ways she did, she did a different role. She had a different role than Margaret Sanger did, right? Like Margaret Sanger was like, this is about free speech, right? In the 1920s and 30s, she was writing a lot, right? So she had more of an intellectual um, kind of framing for the birth control movement. That's not Guadalupe Rispe de la Vega, right? Like she's kind of walking into think this thing that has already been creative, created, excuse me, and she's just like running with it using the power that she has, which is tons of money. She looks like a fairly well off glamorous white woman and she's in you know she has the catholic church in her pocket that's not margaret singer at all right like margaret singer and the catholic church hate each other um but i liken them to each other because of their concern for population control right like that's the right that's that's the the in and the way that they in some ways their stories about you know this is to help prevent abortion this is to help what you know the downtrodden woman, those, their sort of um, origin stories, if you will, are very similar. But yes, you're absolutely right. Like Margaret Singer, from that, they like diverge in different ways. And so that's why I think in Mexico, and again, you know, I we do not talk about this enough, I think in these kinds of circles, but poking at very wealthy, very powerful people in places like Mexico, and I would argue in other countries like in Colombia and other places can be dangerous for scholars and, and journalists. I mean, Mexico is the number one most dangerous place in the world for journalists today. So I think people are very, you know, are very kind of standoffish and, and try to maybe not poke um, people like, like her family. Poke around, I should say. Uh, Julieta, uh, you have a question as well. Yeah, Lina, thanks so much for really an amazing, an amazing presentation. Especially something that I hadn't, uh, I was not familiar with, Thank and you. I appreciate like the finesse of making all these connections that perhaps are not that obvious. Um, and I think it's a fantastic work that you're doing, and I really look forward to reading your book. Something that really caught my attention is this connection that you're making between kind of like reproductive labor, uh, social reproduction and fertility, you know, by tracing the biography of this family, uh, you know, the connections with the, this woman, her husband, and all his work in developing the maquiladora system in Mexico. And I think that's fascinating because a lot of the times we forget that fertility is also about work and labor. Uh, a lot of it. So I love that connection that you're tracing there. And, and I wonder if you found, um, for example, other forms of reproductive control in the maquiladora system. And I'm just thinking, for example, about work in India, for example, in cane and sugarcane fields that require women to go uh, hysterectomies, for example. Um, so I, I was wondering if you found other ways in which fertility politics and you know, labor politics kind of like get together in complicated ways in, in the maquiladora system? You know, that's a that's a great question. And I have it up to this point. I mean, really, I'm using the work of I'm relying heavily, actually, on the work of um, of sociologists and anthropologists in the 19 late 1970s and 1980s who were doing these like massive, you know, award winning um, kind of research projects in places like Juarez and in Tijuana, um, looking at these communities. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's something that I need to kind of, you know, think about more and do more research on. Um, because at this point, what I what I have found is that um, the sort of main linkages is that they, uh, you know, they they did want women of reproductive age right, um, working in the maquiladora system. And, um, but it's unclear, and they did, they did not want them to be pregnant and they preferred them to be unmarried, right, all of these things. And there's a lot of work and it's kind of, 
how do I say this? It's, it's in some ways like two historical things that I'm trying to do. One is looking at the work of, of these scholars who, you know, did such incredible, and most of whom are, are, you know, Chicana scholars, um, or Mexican origin women who are looking at this, um, who are like taking interviews, doing ethnographic work, right? Um, and the sort of politics around how one would do ethnographic work in these communities in the in the 19, late 1970s and 1980s. So like how comfortable did they feel about asking about p women's reproductive care and work, right? Um, and so I have not found up to this point whether or not women were being forced to have you know tubal ligations for instance or recommended to have tubal ligations um and so i i need to do a you know a little bit more research on that in fact this is that's like one of the things that this chapter is sort of missing um is you know were there people at the time um asking these kinds of questions and if not why not right like what does that mean um that's because that's the source material that I have at this point for accessing, you know, again, these institutions are so opaque, right? Like getting access to private corporations records are is so difficult. And especially when they're owned by these like super wealthy people, um, it's, un but, but we can, we can make suppositions, right? Carefully, as historians do. Historians are very like, oh, the source isn't there. I can't say it. But we can, we can, you know. And this is what I'm trying to do: is say, like, we, you know, this is more than a coincidence that her husband is like one of the founders of these things. And in fact, actually, now that you mention it, um, one of the people that I've been working with and who's been very helpful to me has been Miroslava Chavez Garcia, who's a Chicana historian, and she's looking at, um, you know, immigration rhetoric in the 1980s, like late night or most of the 1980s, and sort of like the way population control rhetoric kind of, you know, flows into the 1990s um, and really kind of is the drumbeat of some of these anti-immigration um, policies in the in, late 80s and 90s in the US. And she found records of like these hardcore um, uh, uh, abortion, or excuse me, I keep thinking about abortion, of course. Um, but these these um, anti overpopulation people writing to um, um, De La Vega Matthews, writing to Federico De La Vega, and saying like, is your wife interested in working with us given her so like that and so Miros gave me all of these papers she's like hey I you know I, I know you're working on De La Vega I just found all this stuff so I need to sit with those a little more because she just handed this to me like um not that long ago and so I need to look at that a little bit more but I think that you know certainly there's information in there again De La Vega's voice her voice Guadalupe's voice is not prominent it's these men who are like maybe she can help us with mm -hmm. you know curtailing reproduction. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I just want it to be done. I just want to finish. <laughs> totally. <laughs> that feels like labor. <laughs> okay, exactly. get out. Exactly. <laughs> One of the, the things that Julieta mentioned that like I think it might be good to elaborate on is that like I know that you mentioned in your works that Margaret Sanger actually like brought in Lady Ramaru uh to to the borderlands and like in she also went uh to puerto rico to check out the population control plan there so i was wondering if you wanted to elaborate a little bit on that oh lady ramaru i mean <laughs> they're so funny because you know they they like in el paso they promoted her coming and they were just like oh my god yes you know like she's the like queen of population control uh, discourse in India, like let let us bring her here. And then when she finally gets to El Paso, they're like, oh, but could you not talk about population control, please? <laughs> it was really strange. And so she gets there and they, they spent so much money trying to get her there. Um, and she gives this kind of really milk toast speech that didn't really talk that much about family planning or population control. 
um, which was sort of shocking, I think, to some people who like were really excited that that's what she was going to do. And then the next day she goes, I think she goes to like Dallas or Houston, and that's where she gives this like rousing speech on population control. Um, so, you know, the politics of a place like El Paso are really fascinating. Um, they they wrote you know, letters to um, like right after, or you know, right towards the end of World War II, they write letters to um, sort of military command in Japan because they won't let Margaret Sanger speak on birth control. Like the military, the US military would not let Margaret Sanger come in and they're like, how dare you? And then they get a letter back from like General McMasters or some one of those guys who's like, the Jap yeah, Japanese people know about this. Like they've been doing this. They don't need Margaret Singer right now, like, you know, and this is in like the late, you know, late 1940s, early 1950s. So they did, you know, they were try this little tiny clique, they were trying to be internationally known. Um, and certainly at any opportunity they had, they would claim their work with, um, you know, in the borderlands, right? Like, and, and Margaret Singer says this to them really early on in the 1930s. Um, the late 1930s, she says, you know, you might be the only clinic in the US that supports two countries at once, right? And so she's, she's talking about Mexico. Um, so yeah, like they, you know, they, they, they always um, try to position themselves as sort of like internationalist facing organization or global, I should say, organization. And, and that just like speaks to the transnational nature of eugenics at the end of the day right um which is very very um interesting how this like people like actually mobilize like in order to make those transnational connections and make them known as well um so i was wondering if anybody else had any questions or comments so i think we're going to leave it here. Thank you very much for being with us, Lena. Absolutely. Thank you. It was Thank fantastic. You Thank we really, you. I really appreciate love Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to speak on, on this topic and um, look forward to more conversations with folks in this group. Um, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. If you want to put your email on the chat, sure. like, I'm happy to like you know send that to anybody uh, on the on our Twitter um, messages and everything as well. Yeah. Oh, cool. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. It was good to see everybody.